Hong Kong's million people protest against the extradition law has spilled over to broader areas and the Hong Kongers are not stopping. What are the Chinese Communist regime's options in Hong Kong? The, the Communist Party of China has done things that are inconceivable to most people in the wider world. Yeah, so you said we don't know China, but we know the United States. So what do you think the U.S. would do if there was another Tiananmen Square in Hong Kong? Uh, it would certainly color the presidential election conversation. Uh, so there would be, I think, l pretty loud voices in Congress. I would expect the United States government to do no less than it did at the time of Tiananmen. Hong Kong's situation is relevant to many stakeholders. Uh, who would react to it in the most direct way? If PLA gets involved in Hong Kong, Tsai Ing-wen would become the next president of the Republic of China. I think it has a, a significant effect like that. And what is America's real stake in Taiwan? Amidst the ongoing protest in Hong Kong, my interview with Stephen Yates. He was the Deputy National Security Advisor to Vice President Dick Cheney from 2001 to 2005, and an expert on China and Taiwan. Stephen and I discussed what the Hong Kong protests could do to Taiwan's presidential election in 2020, to the U.S.-China trade war, and the broader U.S.-China confrontation. And finally, to the inspiration of the mainland Chinese people in their own struggle. I'm Simone Gao, and you are watching Zooming In. Okay, so it seems like you think the most the U.S. will do regarding Hong Kong is sanctions, if the CCP destroy the autonomy in Hong Kong. But what about Taiwan? If similar things happen to Taiwan, what will the U.S. do? Well, I mean, there's, there's no way to predict, you know, the exact actions that would be taken. And, and President Trump is somewhat famous for not showing the hand that he would consider by way of actionable options, uh, especially in hypothetical contingencies. Uh, and I, I think that's a wise strategy. But we have the Taiwan Relations Act has been in place for four years. We just spent a lot of 2019 uh, having events around Capitol Hill and around the United States talking about the value of the Taiwan Relations Act, the value of U.S.-Taiwan relations. Uh, we, we've had pretty high profile recognition of that anniversary with a lot of senior U.S. officials involved. So uh, the, the promise of the Taiwan Relations Act was that despite, I think, the executive branch's betrayal of a commitment to the people of Taiwan, the legislative branch compelled uh, this new form of a commitment in the Taiwan Relations Act that, uh, that any kind of move against Taiwan that destabilized what is the status quo in Taiwan by China would be seen as a threat to peace and stability in the in the Western Pacific, as it was called. Today's slogan is the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and so I, it would be inconceivable to me that if China were to move in a fundamental way to degrade, compromise, much less invade the security of, of, the, of the island of Taiwan itself, uh, that the United States would see it as anything other than a threat to peace and stability in the broader Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and you know, what options it would consider uh, mm -hmm. under those circumstances, I would have to believe all options would be on the table, not to say that it would go from one extreme or, uh, or minimal, uh, but the U.S. has a lot of options. I think the people of Taiwan have options, too. It would be a grave mistake for the CCP to think it can or should move in that direction, or that it would be cost-free. What is the United States' stance or preference, if you will, on the presidential election in Taiwan? I, I mean, I, I've served in the U.S. government uh, a different time in my life. I, I wouldn't expect the U.S. government to, uh, to give a clear signal of a preferred candidate or a preferred party. Uh, even though the United States is suspected to interfere in politics all over the world uh, and that it might have secretive choice made uh, to support one candidate or another, I think the U.S. has been very clear about its policy preferences. Uh, and those policy preferences are up for grabs for any nominee of any party in Taiwan's election to align with. Uh, it's very, very clear that in recent years uh, the United States government has grown less than 
happy with the economic relationship we have with China and wants a change. So are leaders in Taiwan going to be talking about how to recalibrate economic relations with China the way the United States is? Uh, are, we've talked about concerns about technology and supply chain security and cybersecurity generally. Are leaders in Taiwan going to compete with proposals to stand up uh, to address those kinds of challenges the way the United States is talking about it? Uh, there's been a broad concern about influence operations degrading institutions in our country. Well, we talked about it before. Media, academic, political. Uh, well, are leaders in Taiwan contending to be the, the next president of Taiwan? Are they going to be competing with proposals about how to safeguard the institutions of freedom inside of Taiwan the way we're trying to look at how to do that inside the United States and elsewhere? Uh, so the, the agenda is one that is open to anyone to align with and compete with. My own view is I hope that we have an opportunity to deal with a leader of Taiwan that is against the Communist Party of China because I think that it has done more to hurt China than any other organization on the planet, that there is a, a government that wants to make the United States its best friend. I'm an American. I want people to want to be friends with us and I want that to be a priority. And if, if that's done with sincerity, I think there's a lot of benefits to both sides. Uh, and then third, uh, I think that the, the people in Taiwan deserve to have leaders competing to represent them and put their interests first. So, so sort of a Taiwan first kind of an approach. So anti-communists, make America your best friend, put Taiwan first, talk about that by way of economic development, talk about that what, by way of uh, advocating for the dignity, security, opportunity, the freedom of the people of Taiwan. And then you've got a partner that I think the United States is comfortable dealing with. Mm -hmm. And so any party could put forward that kind of candidate. If they put forward candidates that advocate policies that are at odds with what I just talked about, then I think it's reasonable for people to think that at least a chunk of the United States government would rather not have to deal with that kind of a leader. How would you judge the current president in Taiwan based on the criterion you listed? Well, I mean, I, my personal opinion probably doesn't matter very much. I'm just one person. Uh, but I, I, my perception of the U.S. government is uh, that they have found President Tsai to be a reliable partner. Uh, and there have been no crises in the Taiwan Strait or in U.S.-Taiwan relations in recent years that U.S. government interlocutors would attribute to uh, activism on the part of President Tsai or her personal interests being put above U.S.-Taiwan relations. These are things that used to get talked about in times past. Uh, inside Taiwan, some people might say, well, she's been too cautious. Uh, and I hear sometimes criticism of President Tsai's tenure along those lines. But internationally, I think it's viewed from this other lens uh, of uh, a leader that has been uh, perceived as responsible uh, a, a, a reliable partner, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, I, I think that's broadly speaking the way uh, President Tsai's tenure in this term uh, has, has, been, has been seen by leaders in the executive branch and the, and the legislative branch in the United States. Um, so I mean, my personal opinion uh, might be the same, might be different, but I don't vote in Taiwan and I don't control the direction U.S.-Taiwan policy goes right now. Okay. So Taiwan is also very divided, and uh, the CCP has heavily influenced various institutions in Taiwan. So how much control do you think the CCP has over the next presidential election in Taiwan? Well, I think a lot of people in Taiwan are on high alert for these kind of influence operations. There's open questions about the ownership of media organizations in Taiwan. That's a concern to me. I think it's a concern to a lot of people that are, are close watchers of things in Taiwan. Um, so there's, you know, we had a, uh, what I consider to be a, a wild distraction about Russia in the United States in recent years. Uh, not because foreign infiltration doesn't matter, but uh, I think that that was wildly blown out of proportion. Uh, and the, the actions that China takes in the United States already for decades have been strategically more significant than what was alleged in that. But the people in Taiwan 
uh, have been very highly sensitized to the buying of social media ads, uh, the organization of uh, various chat forums or groups, and then the media commentary generally that tilts very heavily to one side. Uh, in some ways, the people of Taiwan are resistant to these kinds of things, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, they're humans, and you know you keep hearing these constant messages, and maybe it begins to have an effect. Some people say that is what created the outcome in Kaohsiung mayoral election. Mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that people think that and say that, the fact that the mayor of Kaohsiung is a candidate for president will keep that debate alive, uh, and so. There's going to be, I think, a heavy element of the electorate in Taiwan and the government in Taiwan that's going to be watching out for where's the money coming from that is buying social media ads and media ads and where are uh, the sort of unhealthy influences that, uh, that don't represent the will of the Taiwan people but are trying to shape the will of the Taiwan people as they go to, go to vote in January. Do you have information about how much the CCP has infiltrated into different parties in Taiwan, including the DPP? Well, Taiwan is the most attacked polity on the planet when it comes to cyber attacks and these kinds of influence and other kinds of operations. Uh, so, you know, there's, there, for decades there have, there have been efforts by the CCP to infiltrate and influence and to, to some ways degrade uh, Taiwan's institutions. Uh, and they have their own reasons for, for doing that. I'd have to say, writ large, they haven't been terribly successful given that we have a new generation of people in Taiwan that naturally feel they have their own identity and that the status quo is independence. And so, uh, these influence operations, I think, strategically have not uh, benefited the, the, the CCP quite the way they might like, but their presence is, is widely felt and creates a high degree of anxiety inside Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can't quantify the amount of money or the number of people, but every institution in Taiwan has had some kind of a scandal that uh, pops up, whether it's academic, national security and intelligence, military, uh, politics. I mean, there's, there's lots of areas where people have been exposed to have been corrupted or run into some kind of a problem. Uh, I don't despair about the system itself uh, because uh, the systems still go, even though you might end up with bad apples from time to time. Uh, but clearly, I think that more needs to be done to insulate against this risk. Uh, and oddly enough, China's behavior has, I think, created a broad consensus uh, in Taiwan and in a lot of other countries that this is a priority now. Do you think the Taiwan government and its people are on the same page? Uh, for example, if China did something like deploying PLA in Hong Kong, do you think the Taiwanese people and their government will be on the same page in terms of how they feel and uh, what they would do? For now, yes. Okay. The only way that would change is if the people of Taiwan were to elect someone who had as a priority trying to make a deal with Beijing. And if, if that were the number one priority, then, then I think the people of Taiwan and their government might be at odds uh, when people can see with their own eyes that things are not going in the right direction uh, under CCP rule uh, in Hong Kong or the mainland generally. People of Taiwan don't have clear visibility into places like Xinjiang. Mm -hmm. uh, people in the United States don't either. And so even though that's been a mass scale human rights abuse, there's, it's, it's abstract to a lot of people. But they can see these images of Hong Kong directly. Uh, and the, the proportion of people in Hong Kong that have been involved in the demonstrations is quite stunning. And so I think there's just a broader sense of awareness that things have to have reached a degree of concern that is way beyond the ordinary for that number of people to say, no, enough is enough and I need to go and demonstrate. It's not what a lot of people would naturally think to do. 
And so I think the people of Taiwan have been alerted to that. And there's been a degree of solidarity between people in Taiwan and Hong Kong that I haven't seen in a very, very long time. All right. How important is Taiwan to the United States anyway? Well, I, I'd put it this way. Uh, I think Taiwan is important not to the United States particularly, but it's important to the development of a peaceful, free, and prosperous broader Indo-Pacific region. People think of Asia, sometimes they forget that the Indian subcontinent is part of Asia, and that there's a whole other billion people that are part of the Asian experience, and that democracy is possible and actually functions among a large population state in broader Asia. Uh, and I, so I think when we're, when we're looking at supply chains, the software and hardware of what makes our world move, approaches to energy, uh, approaches to uh, civil rights, human rights, uh, these, these fundamental institutions I was trying to talk about in, in, in academics, politics, and otherwise, the broader Indo-Pacific region still represents a, a, a massive opportunity to the world. Uh, and Taiwan is at the leading edge of some of those developments is, uh, in terms of its democratic transformation. It's, it punches way above its population weight in terms of strategic importance on economics. There are some global brands uh, in tech and other areas that are strategically very important to, to the world, to the American economy, but the broader global economy. And so there, there are a number of ways that Taiwan is strategically important, but it's also, like some degree Hong Kong has been, it's a bellwether for the direction China is going. What kind of country is China becoming? The Communist Party has succeeded in blinding the world to the, to the true nature of China and instead distracted the world by focusing on this very fake concept of one China. When the number of Chinas doesn't matter to the world, the nature of China matters to the world. The kind of country that China is becoming matters to the world. And so Taiwan is an incredibly important bellwether mm. in terms of what we should see as the kind of country that China is becoming. And if it becomes one that is hostile to democratic institutions, hostile and willing to take military risks against a free and democratic people, well, that says something very, very dangerous and big about the, the nature of, of China, the kind of country it's becoming. Uh, and so that's, I think, the strategic relevance of Taiwan to the geostrategy of the United States, but, but not just the United States. On July 31st, the Chinese officials suddenly announced that they would temporarily stop the free travel to Taiwan for mainland Chinese residents. What do you make of it? Well, number one, I think this is another one of those actions by Beijing where they think that they're punishing Taiwan and punishing Tsai Ing-wen, but it's, a, in some ways, a backhanded endorsement of President Tsai. I think the people of well, Taiwan will see this as kind of a belligerent, bully kind of move. So you said it's a punishment for Tsai Ing-wen, but for what? Yeah, that's a good question because I don't know that it's tied to anything in particular other than uh, President Tsai has made clear in her statements in reaction to the Hong Kong demonstrations that one country, two systems it is never going to be applied to Taiwan. Uh, she's uh, in the course of the primary, you know, but not limited to that. I mean, the New Year's, New Year's remarks, she had a very forceful reply to, uh, and uh, she's made very clear that the people of Taiwan are meant to be the masters of their own destiny. Uh, and she is not seeking to change the status quo, but the status quo is the people of Taiwan are the masters of their own destiny. And uh, so uh, I think that it's that maybe there's some element in Beijing that thought that this would be a boost to Han Guoyu and the KMT, that see if you elect them, these inducements can come back the way they were under the Ma administration. Uh, but in some ways, I think it is having the opposite effect on perceptions among Taiwan voters.